Well, um, I have a very curious personal history. My parents were divorced. I was born in San Francisco. My parents were divorced when I was just about three years old, and I went to live with someone else. And so I grew up in Northern California, across the bay from San Francisco in Marin County. <coughs> uh, and I was there for, this was before the Second World War, um, and I was there until living in the countryside in a pretty isolated situation, uh, farming country, until the Second World War, in which I then entered the Second World War and served in the, on the, in the Pacific. And uh, I hadn't thought I would be going to college or anything, but when I came back, uh, <coughs> out of the war, uh, the GI Bill was, in, you know what the GI Bill is? It's an American, it was an American uh, program for college students. You could be, you get four years of school. So I went to, I decided that I could go to college after all, and then I asked a high school teacher where to go, and he told me about a school in Ohio, a small liberal arts college, work-study place called Antioch. I went there, and then, and I majored in literature and philosophy, not in anthropology, because they didn't have it anyway, and I didn't know anything about anthropology at that point. And then when I was about ready to go to graduate school, I had to choose something to go in, and a, a professor there knew about anthropology and, and a, a program that was beginning at Harvard in the social relations uh, department, in which anthropology was combined with sociology, psychology, clinical and, and, and social psychology rather than with uh, physical and, and archaeology as it normally is. And I, that was very attractive, so I went there and I got my degree there. And while I was there, there was a program, a, a research project, a group research project, just to send people to Indonesia, which had just become independent, uh, to Java. And so uh, there were about eight of us. Uh, some of them dropped away after a while, but six or seven of us got there anyway. And we spent two and a half years in a... In a small town in East Central Java doing a community study. I wrote my thesis on the basis of that, on religions of Java, religion of Java. Uh, and the rest is sort of normal sort of academic life. I, I uh, well, it isn't, I guess, that standard. But I, I um, taught at Chicago for 10 years or so, and then I came here to the Institute for Advanced Study, which is where, where we don't teach, actually. It's a research, 250 people come in four schools every year, about 30 or so in social sciences, the social sciences of the schools. And that's what my, and so I've been here now for ooh, 35 years, 36 years. I didn't actually see action in the real sense. I, I was on, I, I, I was electronic technician, which is somebody who repairs radar and stuff. And I was on a heavy cruiser uh, in the, in the uh, Eastern Pacific. I, we were getting ready running down, we were about to be part of the invasion of Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, but just as we were about to go, uh, they dropped the bomb. Uh, the United States dropped the bomb on uh, Hiroshima and then later on Nagasaki. So we turned around and went back. So in a sense, I didn't, don't have a, anything that would give me a post-traumatic syndrome. I didn't get involved in any really uh, intense fighting or any fighting at all, really. Uh, I spent a lot of time getting ready to do that, and, and when the bomb came, it was obviously a, a relief to us, but we didn't know then what it was even, but we, didn't, uh, we weren't going to have to be in the invasion because we were fright, frightened about the notion of doing that. Uh, but I don't have, uh, I, did it, it certainly changed my outlook on things because, as I said, I grew up rural in Northern California in a very isolated situation. I went to a two-room schoolhouse and then to a small high school in Santa Fe. So that, I, that's where I, you know, joined the Navy. See, the world, I, they sent me first to Chicago, and well, first to Idaho, and then for boot camp, and then to Chicago, and then to Gulfport, Mississippi, and then to Treasure Island, San Francisco, uh, for training in this electronic technicians business. And so it made me suddenly cosmopolitan. <laughs> I had been almost entirely isolated rural life, very quiet, and, and very lonely, because I didn't have any parents, and it was all sort of... Uh, so uh, it certainly made me... And then, and then with, combined with the GI Bill, which maybe sent me to college, suddenly projected me out of a completely isolated environment, a completely solitary childhood in, in the middle of nowhere, to do what has been since then a radically cosmopolitan life. Uh, so that changed. But the war itself, uh, being in the Navy, certainly had a lot of influence on me, because again, I was met people I would never have met before. And, uh, but I didn't, I didn't uh, the battle part of it, I didn't have. 
uh, didn't get involved in, luckily. Well, teachers had a great impact on me, both in elementary school and high school. Because I was a smart kid, I guess I must say. I'm, you know, in, in, in the middle of the, when teachers, when, especially when they're teaching in rural school, if they get a smart kid, they pay a lot of attention. So I, I, I got, they shaped my life a great deal and made me have things, you know, ambitions a little bit broader than most people have were that I was around with. I, I lived in a farming community, but uh, we weren't farmers. So I just went back to I was. Father paid for my boarding there, so that's how we lived. It was this during the Depression, the Great Depression. So, so it was. We didn't have a lot of money, but we didn't feel that poor either. We were all right, but uh, it was a. It, it's just uh, sometimes my life seems divided into two halves. Though the halves are unequal by the time, but the, psychologically they're not so much. And the first part is just this extremely isolated, very lonely sort of childhood, and then comes a war and then it changed to a, to just the opposite of that. I've been lived in, ever since then, lived in urban environments. I lived in Chicago. I lived, lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I went to school and, and so on. So was, well, I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a novelist. Uh, and I thought I would try to do that. I, I did try it for a while, but I th decided that I'd really rather write about things that I had something to hold on, so I didn't. But I, I, yeah, I worked on I wrote a part of a novel and some short stories and things of that sort. Um, so that's what I wanted to do and thought I could do, but uh, and, and I thought I would do that. As I say, not going to college, but then when college opened up, I got involved in, in uh, well, I went to school in literature and philosophy, so I was still, still along those lines. But then I shifted when I went to, went to Harvard from Antioch into, soci into, into social rights and anthropology. Well, I, again, I was used to, there's a, this may not be quite the way you should answer, but anthropology is, my kind of anthropology, is a strangely divided kind of, feel it a little divided the way I just talked about my life. When you're in, when you're in Cambridge, Mass, or Chicago, or wherever you are, uh, you're in a highly cosmopolitan, highly intellectual environment of other students, professors. Uh, when you then go for two and a half years, as in the first instance, and I went many times after that, of course, to Java or to Morocco. You're living in a countryside, again, with a very small number of, of rural people. So the, the more than most academics, I think anthropologists, at least anthropologists of my sort, live a divided life. Uh, I talked about ones of being here, being there, you know. And when we're here, we live in this kind of uh, scholarly environment. You sort of see around you here and talk to other scholars. And, you know, and, have you, and our scholarly life is not that much different than any other kind of social scientist. But what we have that most other social scientists don't have, some do, but most don't, uh, is a couple of years in the middle of nowhere trying to, t to talk to people in their own language, understand what they're doing, pretty much on your own. The first time, as I said, there were six or seven of us, but after that I was always myself and with my wife. Um, so uh, that's the kind of experience you have, this kind of constant shifting back between the ultimate of, of uh, Higher, higher per Western civilization on the one hand and, and the third world on the other. I remember, and a lot of people have had this experience of, uh, were like me, that sometimes you're more culture shocked when you come back than when you go out because all of a sudden the cars are going 20 miles, 90 miles an hour and everything is wrangling and jangling and you've been used to a very, very slow life and uh, quiet rural countryside and so on. So it, it has that quality to it. Uh, it was essentially accidental. Um, I was at Harvard and studied to be be an anthropologist. I thought I might go to Brazil, uh, just notionally. But there was a, it turned out that they were f forming this group of people to go to, it was one of the first post-war group projects in the third world. And they were, then I was asked to join it. And uh, I said, yeah, where's Indonesia? <laughs> and I went. Uh, uh, I, so I didn't really choose it. Once I, cho once I got into it, of course, then spent a year or so doing almost nothing but learning the language. And, uh, and learning about Indonesia. And then I went to Holland for a while because it's a colonial metropole. Uh, and uh, studied a little bit more about Indonesia in, in Holland and then went to Indonesia. So, but it, was, it, was, it wasn't a choice. It, uh, it just sort of happened to me. I, my life has been a lot like that. I tell you, you know, I just happened to go. And this guy says, go to Antioch, so I went. And another guy says, go, go to Harvard, so I went. Uh, and it's all been pretty much sort of one damn thing after another, but it, it all seems to have worked out into some sort of a pattern, but it wasn't designed that way. 
And uh, as I said, I didn't really choose to go to Indonesia, though I was very pleased to be able to go. <laughs> <laughs> I met her. I met her. I, this, that was my first wife. I met her at, at Antioch College. Uh, we got married there, and uh, we went to graduate school together. We tend to be endogamous. Well, it's it well again because you lead this funny kind of divided life. You have to have somebody who's willing to do that. I mean, someone who doesn't really want to go out and live in the boondocks for a couple of years is not such a good idea. So it, it, I think it, I, I didn't make the choice on those grounds, but it, but the the that seems to happen a lot. Anthropologists tend to be endogamous. Well, it, uh, w when I was in Java the first couple times because I didn't have them, but then I. When I went to Morocco, they were with us, and they 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 spoke Arabic and French, and they, they forgot the Arabic entirely, alas. But uh, we lived in again in a small town in the middle of Atlas Mountains, and my kids lived there too. And, and we, uh, both my wife and I, were working on our anthropological work, and and the kids were, gee, I guess six and five, six, seven, and eight, or something like that. And they, I think they enjoyed it. Yeah, but they didn't turn out to be anthropologists. Uh, you know, one of them, my son, who's the youngest. They're only about a year and a half apart. One of the uh, son is, is a computer technician and uh, or a programmer and uh, systems engineer, of course, so, in Seattle. And my daughter lives here. She's a school teacher, an elementary school teacher, and, and she has two children who live through those joints over there. Uh, and she's, so that, that's what they became. <laughs> well, for anthropologists, that's easy because it's field work. <laughs> I mean, it's the one thing anthropologists always have to do, or at least they did. And it's, sort of not so much of that strong anymore, but uh, it's still important. And, and so, as you said, why did I go to Indonesia? Well, you had to go somewhere. I mean, it was, in those days, it was absolutely required that you spend some time in a non-Western society, at least six months, and most people spent two years away. I did two and a half years. So uh, for an anthropologist, research is fairly well defined in, in, in a global sense, that you have to go somewhere Normally, uh, at least for the first time outside the Western orbit, though some people more and more just go or only go to, to the United States, but most of them go first somewhere else and then to the United States later and so on. But anyway, uh, research is very well defined for anthropologists, at least in globally. What you do when you get there is, of course, not almost as ill defined as the thing, is, but, but research for, for field anthropologists is, is field work. It's going and living someplace. I went, this town was about 25,000 people, I guess, then, in the middle of the Rondas River Plain. And the same, same thing in in uh, Morocco. I went to a small town at the foot of the Middle Atlas. And you live there, and you speak to the people, and you talk to them, and you and you keep field notes, all those are things up there in my field notes. And uh, so uh, th that's not so problematic. What is problematic is what you do when you get there. And that's really well defined. You have to make it up as you go along, and you talk to people the way you're talking to me, and try to get to draw them out, and find out what you want to know about them as persons, but also about particularly always looking for what is cultural, the cultural aspect of their lives, and what what they understand themselves to be, and want to be, and what their society is, and what their views are. Yeah, I, I actually, it, it is very specific to specific situations, specific people. Mm -hmm. But one way, one thing you realize pretty early on that people like to talk about themselves. I mean, to someone who, who know, you know, if you can get some sort of rapport with them, they will come forward because they like to talk about themselves and their lives and their views, and nobody ever asked them. You know, I mean, it, if you go to a small town in the middle of Brazil, nobody ever came around and asked them what they thought about much of anything. And so uh, I found that if I want to talk about Islam or, or I want to talk about art forms like the shadow play or something, people would feel that they were suddenly expert in this. This was something they knew that I didn't know and they could teach me this. So I think that's true and it's true in Morocco too. Uh, we talk about fantasy or something. You, you try to get people to, you try to put people in the position that they're the, which they are, the authorities that you're trying to get things from. And, and then you play them off against one another. I don't even play them off in any kind of devious way, but Somebody tells you something, you ask the other person in a different situation about this, and you, and you get them interlocked, and you begin to do that. So that, I think, is true. I was surprised, actually, how cooperative people mostly were. Of course, there's always somebody who won't talk to you and w w w wouldn't like to see the last of you. And you just, then you just say, all right, I'll find somebody else. But especially I in places that were pretty popular, there was always somebody else. <laughs> so, uh, but generally, people I found uh, were, at least then, I, maybe it's changed a bit now, but I don't think, I haven't found that. 
uh, they were quite fairly responsive if you talk to them. I mean, you, some of them full of baloney, but some of them weren't, and you talk to them. And, then, and uh, uh, but I, I think uh, people like to be experts. I remember you go to they'll say, you came to the right place. How come you come to ask me about all these moral things about my society and so on? Which no one never asked them before and probably never will ask them again, but uh, it's worked out pretty well. Uh -huh. yeah, you get, well, you get overlapping accounts. What, uh, I mean, A tells you just about B and B tells you about C and C tells you about A and you get the whole interaction with that. You know? Well, sort of what I just said, uh, is for an anthropologist, it's, it's getting people's self-descriptions and descriptions of the society in fairly colloquial terms. You, know, you, you work in the language. You can't really do this if you don't know the language. You should well, well enough to do it. And uh, so I guess that's, well, I did some quantitative work as well. I mean, I used to try to find out about how many kids were going to school and, you know, and, and, and uh, that was having the population dynamics. But mostly uh, I was concerned with when something tells you about A, it tells you something about B, and B tells you about C, and C tells you about A, and so on. You get you get a configuration of ideas and, th and things that, that make it possible to give a qualitative, uh, descriptive account, a thick of whatever, hopefully, of what's going on. Well, I once tried to formulate it. I don't know if it's the right way. It was the long lines I just said. Quantitative research, at least in one aspect of it, tends to take a class of people, all the people who wrote dissertations on Henry James in from 1950 to 1960, and, and uses them as independent data points and so on, and then tries to assemble them into some sort of a usually statistical or at least mathematically descriptive account. Whereas the qualitative aspect is, is, is that you do try to get a configuration of, of responses from people so that they play back and forth with each other and you get uh, a multi-dimensional view of what's going on. Uh, I do mostly qualitative research, but when it's when there's need to have quantitative research, for example, I was interested in an endogamous marriage when I was working in Bali some years later. And uh, you have to have a measure of what, uh, what and endogamy is difficult to measure because of, well, I did a technical part I won't go into, but because the size of the group matters when you're endogamous. When you're exogamous, it doesn't, isn't the same. But, you know, a large group can more easily be endogamous than a small one, that's obviously. And so, we, so you need rather sophisticated statistical techniques in order to be able to decide whether endogamy is really operative or not. So when, the, when the quantitative techniques are called for, I'd use them, though most of the time I would be concerned with telling, finding out uh, what endogamous marriage was. Did they really want to marry their cousin or didn't they? And that sort of thing, that's the kind of quality. And their feeling about, about endogamy and about, uh, about family and about uh, the, the very rivalous cliques in the, on a kinship basis. Well, Wittgenstein probably has profound influences on almost anybody. But it, it's an odd kind of influence in that I had done most, of, not most, I'd done, I'd rel well launched my work before I reread Wittgenstein. Uh, because the book, uh, the, the famous philosophical investigation only came out in 1955, I think. So by, so by then I had already begun to work. And so what he did is reconfirm and, and give sort of articulation to some of the things I felt rather diffusely. Um, I did use the hermeneutic circle a good deal in trying to talk about getting a general picture and then going to a smaller picture and playing back and forth dialectically between the two. And the fusion of horizons and so on that Gadamer talks about. And the sort of uh, uh, interpretive approach to things that uh, Paul Ricoeur used. I used Paul Ricoeur's uh, actual model of the text essay in the, in the, in the cockfight piece that I wrote that some has a certain circulation. Uh, so I, was, I actually did employ specific kinds of techniques from the hermeneutic circle, uh, language games, the whole business of that, that, uh, that, that whole tradition uh, established. They're not entirely cohesive, but it gives you a kind of orientation. But as I say, I was fairly well launched in that direction before I read most of those people. But what they did do was make, make it possible for me to articulate what it was I was trying to do. So it's a funny kind of influence. It's, uh, it's very real and profound. I'm sorry, not dumb and dumb because it's very strong. But it didn't come that first you read them and then you do the work 
it's more the other way around. First you do the work, then you read them and find out what it was you were doing or trying to do, and then you can articulate it better. Yeah, well, the f f uh, I studied Indonesian for a year and a half or so before I went, and by the time, and it was, it was, this was set of this project that started, it was really well financed with those dice, especially by Ford and so on, so we had money to do that. So I studied Indonesian by the time I got to, to Holland and so on, and I studied Dutch at, uh, at, uh, as well. And, uh, and then I lived in Holland for a while and perfected the, well, didn't perfect it, but I got it better anyway, Dutch. Um, and then went to Indonesia, and I spoke Indonesian by the time I got there reasonably well, actually. And then I studied, because I was going to not work in Indonesian, as a matter of fact, mostly. You could did some work in Indonesian, but most of it was in Javanese, which is a related language like Portuguese, Spanish kind of distance. And so I learned Javanese through Indonesian. I got a bunch of college students to come in. We did, the whole of the language learning was oral, oral, that is, you just talk. And, and, and so by the time I got, it was eight months, I was in Indonesia for about eight months before I actually got into the town that I was studying for because of various kinds of complications, which turned out to be a good idea because I really got Javanese. So by the time I got to, um, to this town that I studied, I knew both Indonesian and Javanese. As for Arabic, I did the same thing in a way. I started studying it while I was in Chicago. Uh, I, st I took classical as a, just as a course uh, with students. Uh, but I don't speak that, and nobody does. I mean, some people do, but I mean, not, they don't speak it in ordinary life. They speak a colloquial. So I learned colloquial Moroccan Arabic uh, from, there were a couple of Moroccan students there, and I did, again, the same oral, oral business. And then I went twice to Rabat, which is the uh, capital of Morocco, lived there and, and studied, did nothing but study Arabic. So again, by the time I got to the town I studied, which is the Middle Atlas, as I said, a few miles from Fez, um, I could speak Arabic at least well enough to get started, and then I just kept learning it as I worked. Well, I, I don't know about facility, but I certainly believe in learning them, <laughs> and so I put a lot of effort into it. I, I don't think I'm particularly gifted at lang learning languages, but I certainly spent an awful lot of time studying them because I, I, I really feel you can't work. Uh, well, you can, but I mean, I didn't want to. I wanted to work in, in the language, and, uh, and I did. No, I, well, I had Latin in high school, but I didn't, and might as well not had it. I don't remember a word of it. Uh, no, in college I let, took a little French. I learned French later, actually, because I need French for North Africa as well, because it's a colonial, and it's like Dutch for... Uh, but no, I didn't, didn't know. My language learning was almost entirely connected with my field work. I never took a... Well, I took one course in French in college, Learned a little bit, but not much, but because I didn't have any use for it. But as soon as you, as soon as you're speaking the language and you are trying to ask people questions and understand their answers, it gives you much more motivation to learn, and you get a much more flexibility of learning, rather than uh, uh, pen of my hand is on the table sort of stuff. You get, you get, you know, real sort of colloquial talk. Yeah, I don't think that first place there, when when I when we, this is for, a Ford grant uh, for the Ford Foundation when the Ford Foundation was rather differently oriented than it is now, much more oriented toward research and so on than it is now. But um, the notion, that was the time just after the war, at the beginning of the Cold War, actually, when the United States was terribly interested in trying to understand other countries. Uh, it had the isolation of before the war had been broken down by the war. And right after the war, the United States suddenly found itself at least notionally a great power. And so very much concerned with understanding the third world and other places. So it was a, there was a great fashion for those area studies, what is called area studies. People worked on India and South Asia. People worked on Indonesia and Southeast Asia or North Africa, the Maghreb and Morocco, aerially, and focused on that. And there was money around for it then. There was a lot of it. Now it, it, that seems to have died some quite some time ago. Not died. It's not dead. But it's, but it's much less now. Americans are much more, I think, rather enwrapped in themselves, much less open to the world than they once were. They're more involved in it in some ways, but they're much, uh, not much open to the, what's going on. Um, so there's less, there's not, there's still money, but there isn't as much, and it isn't as, it was, though that was a particularly, from about 1950 to 1960, you know, I don't know, to look back and see what the dates were. Yeah, there was a great, there was a, foreign area language program, there was all kinds of stuff, all kinds of money for 
for people who were willing to go out and live in Africa or Asia and, and find out what the rest of the world was like. Because at that point, the United States was interested in it. It wasn't that it was a mission business. It didn't do that. We didn't have any connection with the government. But it did. There was, the atmosphere was such that the Americans were beginning to learn. Through. And you know, when I was asked to talk about did I choose Indonesia, I hadn't heard of it really before. Uh, I didn't know the difference between Indonesia and China. I think most people didn't. Um, uh, so uh, there was that the magic moment, the magic decade, I guess, when the, there was money for this kind of work and people did it. Uh, now I think it's it's less so. It's harder to get money. Uh, also, there's a kind of well, we can talk about that again. There's a kind of scientism which makes people want to have hypotheses and tested things and so on. Uh, we were much freer to be able to do what we wanted, and they were interested in just. I remember I worked in, in Indonesia. There was a a Harvard team of economists who worked in Jakarta mainly, not where I was, but they were very interested in trying to find out what we, you know, these were economists who were very technical economists and made mathematical models and the whole bit. But they were quite interested in what we found out. And I was interested in what they were doing as well. And there was much more of an interchange than there is now. Now, there tends to be a kind of science wars thing going on that you know, makes it difficult for, it's harder and harder to justify or the, the justification isn't accepted for doing qualitative research than it once than it was then. Now I don't want to overdo that. It, people are still doing it; they're still getting money for it. So it's not; it's all closed down. But there was that period, from yeah, I guess 1950 to about 90, early 60s, mid 60s, uh, breaks down with uh, everything else breaks down in the 60s. Um, there was uh, it was a golden moment for this kind of research. Well, it is harder to do anthropology now too. You have to get. Sometimes they try to apply. Um, procedures which work well enough for psychology or something to anthropology. So they want you to, for example, to get release forms from your informants, and you can't, you, you couldn't work that way. I mean, people won't sign a release form. The reason I said you'd go and talk to them, and you get to be friends, and, and if you put a thing around, they would say, I don't have anything to do with it. So you have, it's, it makes it to convince people that this, that plus is, is a, there is that, and there's also the business of is it really scientific there's a lot of obsession about about that a kind of spiritual hypochondria about so between the two of them between having to pass review boards and we do have to do that and that's good and it, and i think in one sense of course it's good anthropology is part of what's happened in the last 20 or 30 years as anthropology has become anthropologists have become more self-conscious about what they're doing and, and the validity of it and, and the ability to speak for somebody else, which is not what we're trying to do. We're trying to get them to speak for themselves. But but it is a, it is a, a, an issue and it's become a very rooted issue in, in, in anthropology about, about uh, you get everything from extreme spiritual hypochondria, which is people won't move because they're afraid that, that, they're, that it's illegitimate and it's always the West studying the East and we're studying down and all. And I don't, and I don't think that's all wrong. I mean, I think uh, <clears throat> one has to be self-conscious about what one's doing. I think one can overdo it and get to the point where one doesn't do anything. Um, and I, I could, I'd be quite happy to justify my work in, ter in, in contemporary moral terms. But, but it's uh, that has happened, and, and you get a great deal of, of sometimes over reflection of of moral dilemmas of a sort which are probably not very real and and, and, and a neglect of moral dilemmas which are really real and that you just pass over. Uh, anthropology is a peril, morally perilous enterprise and that there is there is that question of who am I to do this and what grounds am I going to do it on and who am I to say what they say and so on. And all you can do is face up to it and try. One of the things that I've always tried to do is, is to write in I'm saying the first person, but to write at least in a, in a recognizable style, so it's clear who's talking, and and that should be taken with the usual grain of salt. When they, so I don't, I don't represent myself as an omniscient narrator about Java. I I say, well, I talked to X, and X said this. It's a little bit closer to being to being uh, honest, anyway. I hope. Yeah, I think the main doubts that people put forth when you do this kind of work is, is, is this objective? Is it scientific? Is it, you get a lot of that. Again, how do we know what you say is so? Uh, what kind of evidence for this is there? And uh, particularly as scientism sort of reigns supreme, 
you do get this kind of um, critique. How do you know your interpretation is valid and has any grounds? And that's a real question. I'm not trying to reject it, but uh, uh, as I say, I try to answer it by, by the way I write and what I have to say. And and and, uh, um, and but I think there's been a lot of comment and concern about what a good interpretation is like, how you can tell a good one from a bad one. And we've all written about that and written about our own. It makes our work more self-reflexive than it was. I mean, we now my clear is written from a certain subject position, and people realize that. And then it's for it is foregrounded. Again, when I started out in anthropology, most almost all anthropological monographs were written in omniscient third person kind of way. So it was just I mean, Evans Pritchard was a great anthropologist, but he never spent much anguish in his press over what he was saying. It was very clear. This is it. This is that. They do I believe this, do I believe that, do I do this, they do that. And I'm saying that put him down because he was absolutely a great anthropologist. But uh, that kind of style now is is less, you get away with it less. You have to really sort of say, well, I talked to X and X said this, and then Y said that, which wasn't the same thing. And uh, and you work at it that way in a, in a much more, uh, at least I try to, uh, sensitive way. More than that, I don't see what you can do. Uh, but there is a there is there is a split in anthropology and, and I think in the social sciences generally between people who are really want to make it a, into a science on a model of physics or something of the sort chemistry and people like myself again they we all vary they don't necessarily all have my views but they have this kind of approach uh, which is to say that uh, each discipline and each kind of work has its own standards and its own way of going to things and trying to justify those and, and say what we were saying. Well, this is an after the fact sort of thing too. I, I wrote that piece, well, there used to be editors, you know, and, and they, they don't have those anymore, but there used to be fine editors in the public. And I was collect, I thought I would collect a bunch of my essays, which is what the interpretation of cultures is. But I didn't have the first, that first chapter wasn't among them, it was just a bunch of essays. And the editor said, you've got to write an introduction to this. To clue them all together, he says, there is a theme mag in the book, but you've got to state what it is and bring it out. So again, it, it was after, I just wrote it for this volume. I took the, looked at what I had already written and the other 10 essays or 12 or whatever there is in there, and, and wrote a thick description as an account of what I thought I had been doing in all of these essays, one way or another. So again, it was a kind of, First you do it, then you say how you do it. <laughs> yeah, it, it not, rather the other way around. So uh, it's, it's interesting. It, it, I guess maybe if I had to do over again, I would have put a footnote saying that. But I, I mean, because it, I think it does look as though I had this this essay, and then I went and did all these things. It's the other way around. I went and did all these things, and then I wrote the essay saying, "Well, this is what I was saying, or trying to say, or what I'm trying to do," and uh, it was almost a kind of self auto critique sort of attempt to try to see what what I was up to. So it's a, uh, it is a unusual sort of thing, and as I say, I would have never written it except the editor said you can't just have all these sort of essays there and, and no general account of what they're all about. And so I then sat down and wrote, and then I wrote <laughs> uh, thick description. Well, I think actually culture is what anthropology spends most of its time trying to clarify. When I came in to anthropology, there was a kind of keg of custom notion. It was culture was all learned behavior. And there's nothing wrong with that, and there's a lot of people still operate with that rather simple thing. You know, there's genetically determined behavior, and then there's learned behavior, and learned behavior is, is for human beings, is culture, is cultural. And I say I don't. It's not that that's wrong. It's just that it's so broad and so diffuse that I wanted to make it, uh, and not only me, the whole generation of people, wanted to make it a little bit more explicit and narrow, and more uh, narrow it in the sense of focused. Uh, idea so that it didn't was that we had more than one concept to the whole discipline well I think because of, of a feeling of, of a turning away from the earlier monographs as I say which were all in third person and people just describe culture and they say the Hopi do this and the Zuni do that and the Kwaki will do this and somebody else does that and the culture was then sort of a cake of custom notion and when we got into as me and a lot of other people did to trying to see culture is distributed, to see it as, as multiply focused, to see it as not integrated, that the lines between one culture and the next were not as sharp, they've fused into each other. Uh, we felt we needed a, a more specific kind of concept. For me, 
not for everybody, but for me, that meant turning toward the whole problem of meaning. And, what the, uh, and thinking of culture is, as people's symbolic structures that give meaning to their lives. I may have been influenced that direction because I started off working, as I said, on religion. Uh, in Java, there was there is a Hindu, a Muslim, and a sort of animistic element all mixed together in various kinds of proportions, which I tried to sort out and, and reintegrate in my thesis and in the book I published on it called Religion of Java. Um, so I needed a concept that was a little bit narrower, so we could have some other concepts besides just one sort of master, and, and just don't. And you could no longer say things like culture made them do it, sort of thing. You know, I, uh, uh, you had to really think about how meaning structures were assembled, how they were put together, how they were taken apart, how they clashed, all those sorts of things. And that, at least in my view, and I think it, this is generally, even though people have different views of, of exactly what they mean by culture. Uh, but there's been a great deal of discussion of all this, um, but it gives it a concept with some edges to it and not just a sort of generally diffuse sort of, as I say, the Kwaki will do this and the Zuni do that and so on. Well, uh, actually that sort of, that again was a period when all of a sudden people started getting interested in these things. I, I, uh, when, they, when the old monographic tradition and the old concept of culture sort of became a little bit disassembled and disaggregated, so people no longer wrote uh, the bongo bongo and so on kind of essays. We're beginning to write more different kinds of, uh, we're getting away from the classical realist monograph and doing many more interpretive works. And the impact of people like Levi Strauss and others who, uh, who wrote uh, with great force and earlier on Malinowski and so on, it became clearer to all of us that the voice of the anthropologist was of some interest uh, that it was not just a, a photographic image of some other people, but it was somebody talking with and about other people. And so I was concerned, and, and I, again, I wasn't alone in this, there were a number of other people too, um, in how anthropological monographs were constructed, how the author appears in the text, and uh, how uh, the text is developed to encompass whatever theoretical perspectives they have. So I took I st actually, I started, it was, again, it was a book that was assembled a little bit after the fact. Well, I was asked to give a talk at a, at a sort of casual seminar in NYU. So I didn't have anything to do, and so I, I did, uh, I mean, I just thought it, I'd talk, they wanted me to talk about Levi Strauss. I didn't want to talk about structuralism as such, because by then everybody and their uncle was talking about structuralism. I did nothing. But I, w I wanted to talk about how Levi Strauss put together his, especially his Tristopic, the sort of autobiographical, well, it's, it's a memoir, it's not autobiographical, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a very, very uh, artistically constructed book. So I gave that seminar there, and, and I didn't think much of it. I put the paper aside and publish it or anything. Then I went off for a year to Oxford to, to, uh, to teach. I was an amazement professor. And I gave a talk then, I, I was asked to give a talk for the JRAI, though, uh, what does it stand for? RAI right, stands for the Royal Anthropological so Institute Association in, in, in London. And I, so I, I brushed up and, and made tighter that Levi Strauss paper and I gave it. And uh, it was well enough received, but there were a lot of comments from the Brits about, well, that's the way the French do it. You know, we, we, don't, we, we, just, write the, we just write the sort of something. So I took a, a private oath of my own that I was going to do a job on, Le on Evans Pritchard, who is the quintessential, and a great anthropologist, I mean, I, but he writes in this, he wrote in this through a glass clearly sort of uh, way. So I went back and wrote that, and then later I was asked to give, I mean, again, I have now these two things, I hadn't posted either one of them. Then I was asked to give a, a, a series of lectures at Stanford, and I added a couple others from Benedict and Malinowski, and then I had the book. So this was assembled, this is over about a three or four or five year period of trying to see how each of these people made their, all, all of these four uh, people, I, it was Levi Strauss, Malinowski, uh, Benedict, and uh, who else? Well, anyway, um, I had to see how they uh, put together a text so that it was actually written by somebody that just dropped from the sky as a, as a found object and trying to see how that affected their interpretations and their, works.
wealthy people do it. Yeah. So that's what I did. Um, and I wrote a friend reading that chapter, and, and then lo and behold, a book. Uh, <laughs> oh, sure, it's very widespread now. Uh, we, we become a lot more self-conscious. In fact, the danger is we get hypochondriacal. I mean, you get people spend, spend time taking their own pulse. But there's a lot of it now. I mean, I think people, almost nobody, I don't think you could write a, well, you certainly wouldn't, couldn't, it wouldn't get as much, people still do it, but uh, you can't write a book as, as uh, in that quite as authoritative a manner as you once did. Almost everybody has to at least make some gestures in this direction uh, now. Uh, and it's a lot of people, I don't, we, this interview is about me, so I talk about me, but it, I don't mean to suggest by that that I'm the only person doing these things. So. Uh, what I said in one piece I wrote is, is you go you go out and do something and you think, gee, uh, this is really original, and you come back and you start doing it, you look around, everybody else is doing the same thing. It goes, you know, there's a sudden kind of... So the, the turn toward self-reflexivity, toward c consciousness of, of writing as, 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 uh, as at least the main medium in which anthropologists works, not the only one. Museums and other things are also medium in this film and so on. But most anthropologists still are, are the medium is... is some form of monograph or, or something, um, or at least an account or something. Uh, but yeah, I think it's everywhere now. I don't, you don't see too many of this just sort of chapter one, family chapter two, state chapter three, economy or something. You don't, uh, people, that kind of model is, it may still occur in some sort of serial publications and so on, but it doesn't as a, as a, Almost all the important anthropology books the last few years, last couple of decades, have a, a style and a form to them. Well, I think what happened, of course, again, anthropology tends to follow the flag, as we say. It, it's now, it was a time when, again, anthropology grew up, this has been a lot of discussion, this it grew up in a colonial period, when, when you know, again, the, the, the people were just objects. I mean, they were, they were, uh, and uh, and the the, uh, the Japanese or the Moroccans or so on or whomever were not part of the discourse. They were just quoted. I mean, they were just ventriloquized. Uh, uh, we'd go out and ask some questions, come back and give the answers into into cinematographic form. So they weren't really part of world discourse, but. Uh, they broke into world discourse not through anthropology, but through becoming independent in various civil wars and, and uh, revolutionary wars and so on. So that the Moroc both the Moroccans and Indonesians, of course, had violent separations from there, especially in Indonesia, had a violent separation from the Hall. Dutch and Moroccan was less violent, but it was some there too. Uh, they became independent and began to speak in their own voice. So you no longer could take that colonial, you know, I ask the questions, you give me the answers, and I would I'll tell people back home what you said. Uh, now you do try to find some way to get them into, uh, to get yourself into a discourse which is not consigned to either the West or the non-West and so on, try to enlarge, as I say, the uh, discourse. So you no longer can be treated as just objects. They're actors on the world stage. And as I say, it's not anthropology that did that. I mean, it's, uh, uh, as I said, it follows the flag, it changes. Uh, uh, when the conditions change, the kind of simply working in these places. We were talking earlier about getting permission to work here and so on, getting access. But getting access there is what is difficult. Now you have to, you have to get it from a, an independent government. You don't have a colonial office that can just send you and say, okay, you go do this and we'll, we'll send six people to help you and so on. Uh, now you have to convince, and in both cases, in Morocco and Indonesia, it was a very complicated and difficult diplomatic task to convince governments, local local potentates, to to allow you to work and to find and do what you're doing. So you have to deal with the army, you have to deal with with all kinds of people. That, that uh, so it, it, the whole situation changed around anthropology. Uh, uh, before the war, anthropologists just went out to some uh, some island, and you know, and and it was. Colonial real, and you get get on a boat and go and live there, and that was that. Ask people questions, come back and write a monograph. It wasn't that simple, but I mean, it was, but the change in the political conditions under which you operate is radical. I mean, and of course, right now it becomes even more perilous because it's difficult. You know, you know, it's hard to. I wouldn't want to try to work in the Middle East right now. It'd be difficult, but it could be done, and people are doing it. And I had no trouble in Morocco, but uh, it's. Uh, 
the world changes, and, and you have to change with it, and, and uh, willy-nilly, uh, it's no longer that kind of... There's still a few people who work on very isolated groups and so on and do it that way, and it's very valuable because those people are disappearing. But, but uh, I've always worked on very alive societies and politically independent societies. I, I got to Morocco, I got to Indonesia, excuse me, uh, just to, shortly after independence, and Morocco too, just shortly after independence from Morocco. Uh, and so I was plunged into the middle of a political maelstrom it wasn't mine, it was theirs, and I had to figure out how to operate in this kind of a situation. Very much less clear cut than a, than a colonial situation. Hot tips, I don't know what to say. Uh, I, I do think when I was teaching, I always tried to, to tell students that, that writing well mattered. That writing is not just decoration, it's not just um, something that you add on top like frosting on a cake. It's, it's really part of a, I sometimes was successful and sometimes wasn't. But they write, you know, there's a tendency in, in the social science, especially to write in jargon and to write in a, in a heavily pretentious sort of way. And I kept trying to tell them, you know, you won't be read if you do that, for one thing, if you want to be just practical about it. But uh, I think it's to see writing as integral, at least for an anthropologist of my sort, to see writing as integral to the whole enterprise and not just something that you loo on afterwards and just paste on as a kind of, the core, or you write in this barbarous jargon that you get, uh, but that that that's seamless. That the, the the writing and the research. Sometimes they would say, you know, I would criticize a paragraph or a sentence as being obscure, and they would say, well, I know what it means, and you know, you know what it means, and I yeah, I say I sort of know what it means, but I sort of but but uh, to get people to feel that writing is not an optional thing. I mean, it's something you have to do, and you might should do it well and write. Is. Now, how to do that, I don't know that I have any secrets of that, except to, uh, to, to want to write. You have to, I think to write well, you have to think about writing as an independent good of itself. That is, that is, it is part of the whole enterprise. It's not just, as I say, something going through. Uh, I, as I told you, I started off wanting to be a novelist anyway, and so, uh, and some of my enemies say I still am. But uh, the... Uh, uh, I always regarded writing well as important, as as integral part of what it's all about. You don't, in a novel, you don't say the story is one thing and the writing is something else. I mean, they, obviously, the, it's the writing that makes the story go and happen. And it's no different in anthropology. And it's also, there's also a story. Hopefully, it's a true one, or at least approximately true. Uh, um, but you, you uh, uh, the writing is what makes it happen as well. If you're really, that's what you're doing, writing books. There are other, as I say, media. So it's not only just writing, but but uh, that's mostly what I do. I don't really know. I suppose I became more, a little bit more confident in my writing style than I once was. I mean, no, I'm not confident even now. <laughs> I mean, I but uh, but uh, I don't know. I, that's hard to say because I'm inside of it and I can't. And I don't spend a lot of time, you know, reading my stuff and seeing how it changed. Just so I don't, not that narcissistic, but um, I don't know. Uh, it changes, of course, with the subject. Uh, what you're trying to do when you write about religion, you write one in certain kinds of ways. Where if you write about kinship, you write in somewhat different ways because of a different subject. It's like if you have a different kind of a novel, you write with a different kind of style. No, it's, again, it's always the same. If, if, if I keep carry this novel thing a little further, but you know, uh, 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 someone who writes novels of Bellow or Roth or something, you can see that's their novel all the way through. But they, it changes depending on what their story they're telling and what they're trying to say is, it change, or it changes subtly at least. Um, and I, that's what I think. I don't think the anthropology is so different in that sense, except of course, as I say, we are. You have to be bound by certain kinds of rules that you don't have in a novel, but having to do with uh, truth. So, well, other, yeah, I'm not openness, but certainly interest in, because they have to be. One of the problems, I, one of the reasons behind American parochialism is they sometimes, we sometimes don't, don't think that we need to take care of other people's views because we're so big and powerful and wonderful. Uh, whereas if you're in Indonesia, you certainly want to know about what the United States is all about, because it's fate and your fate are entangled in a way that, that which is not reciprocal, it's not, it's not balanced. It should be reciprocal, but it's not. Uh, 
So I, I think, uh, and, and also there, of course, there's a tremendous internal variegation, variegation. That's true in the United States, too. This is a very multicultural society. And aside from ideologies and everything else, it just is. Uh, we're not going through a big immigration argument and so on about Mexicans and so on, and, but there are all kinds of people now. Uh, very large groups of Indians and Chinese and all kinds of people in the United States, Muslims. Uh, so I think it's becoming apparent that some sort of attempt to try to understand what these cultural differences are and what they mean and how they work and how you can understand them and, and how you can get across them and make it possible to communicate and deal with it. But what that means for, I don't know enough about how a teacher trying to her that I would be able to give much direct practical. Well, again, it would be nice. Uh, again, it used to be that there were many more foreign films than perhaps there are now. There used to be a lot of French films, as you see, but, and uh, German ones and so on, but there is perhaps a few less now. than. But I, I don't think I should hold forth about film. I don't really know much about it. Uh, well, I think, it, as they say, ethnography has become more differentiated. It's not just a matter of, of simple descriptions of other people, but the and the emphasis on performance has become very important. Obviously, people are writing uh, uh, essays in performative anthropology, which are really quite interesting about uh, uh, getting some appreciation of other people's performance uh, genres. Are really very, you know, I, I, I've written about about uh, shadow plays and things of that sort, which are, oh, and m more of that is one way to understand another culture if you're in a elementary school or something is to get some insight into those things because kids I think would be quite responsive to stuff about the dance. And, uh, I've written about dance and I've written about uh, about uh, as I say, shadow plays and various kind of Quranic chants and so on to get a broader notion of what kind of uh, aesthetic and uh, forms of expression there are in the world. It's very hard to get up every day and go ask people questions. I mean, <laughs> to go out and into their homes. And, so, and some of them don't want to talk to you, and some of them do. But it's it's so easy to just sit around and not do anything. Uh, you have to constantly put yourself forward and go to very strange places and, and in the heat of a tropical or a desert environment, in both cases. It was, it was, to do that and to get to, to say, well, I've got to do this. I've, this is something that has to be done. And, to keep going like that, so you you can get very lonely in the field. I mean, it gets very isolating feel. You know, you, you, know, you just like to figure, well, I just what I would need is a milkshake and a <laughs> hot dog, and and uh, you can't do that. You have to s just keep at it. It's a the thing about field work is it's a 24-hour day job. Uh, and you're just doing it all the time. You, there is no time when you're not working because you're living among these people, and anything that they say at any point might be of just what you were trying to do. Because not all, I, I don't do a great deal, I did some, but you don't spend all your time doing formal interviewing. You talk to people, you go ten, ten shadow plays, you ten meetings, and you do things of this sort. And you, keep, and you talk to people just casually, walk around town, walk around the market, sit down, sit, chat with somebody. And you're constantly trying to figure out what's going on. So it's very exhausting, and it's very isolating, and it's very lonely. And after two and a half years, you're pretty much had it, <laughs> you sort of worn out. Well, I was kind of surprised. If you'd asked me before whether I would be any good at this, I would have said no, because I was, I was such an academic type. But it turned out, and indeed I do, was very worried about whether I would be able to do this, whether I would be, you know, again, just as I say, being out there in the middle of nowhere. And there's illness and there's all sorts of things that come up and all kinds of crises that come up. And actually I turned out to, to to, to be, if I may say, so pretty good at it. I, I went around and, and I did stay there and I worked at it. So I found out something about myself that I didn't know, that, uh, you know, that I really liked as much being outside the academic environment. The, as again, I talked to before about this binary thing here and there. And there is so unlike anything here. I mean, it just has no, f it doesn't have any kind of form. You can't schedule your life the way you do in an academic thing. Uh, and you have to play it all by ear and every day you're trying to make new acquaintances, which is a painful thing to do, actually. Especially since you don't know how you're going to be received and you don't know exactly what you want. You try to get people talking so you can find out what it is you want. And you listen to them, you sit in coffee shops and talk to them and so on. And I guess I was sort of surprised that actually I could do it. I, I, when I taught those 10 years in Chicago, it always seemed to me that 
because of this divided two two prong notion of it, you could never tell whether a student who was good in class would be good in the field, or vice versa. Some people who were crackerjacks and in, in, you know and get A's on exams, and good 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 papers, go to the field and they panic and they just can't deal with it. And some who in, couldn't you know didn't quite know what was going on in class were tend to be terrific. But it isn't always that way. Some people who were good in class were also good in the field, and some people who were dumb or dumb in both places. I mean, uh, so it, but it, you can't predict from one to the other. And as I say, even my own self, I couldn't predict. I got it sort of wrong. I thought this. I'm not going to. I'm really not going to. I was really very worried about it. But I turned out to be okay at it, at least. And uh, uh, as I say, you never can tell with the students. You can't until they're in the field. You can't tell whether they're going to be able to do it or not. Uh, so it's one of the best anthropologists I ever knew, he's dead now, uh, worked in Morocco, um, and he flunked out of Penn, I guess it was. He couldn't get finals, I mean, he couldn't, he couldn't get his doctorate. Uh, but he, so he said the hell with it, and he went out to Morocco, lived there, and wrote you know, very fine books about Morocco, and very good time, became one of the leading people working on Morocco. He would never. He was a little different than me. I thought I was just too damn intellectual and sort of a precious character. Would never be able to do it. In his case, you would think, well, he's you know he doesn't really understand all this stuff. Uh, he can't get can't even pass the class courses. And he went out and did a beautiful job. And uh, so it's 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 very hard to. It, it really is divided, and you can't tell. So you have to have two kinds of personality to do it. I guess to do both. Actually, this man I'm talking about never went back to, he wrote a lot of things, but he never went back to the academic life at all. He just lived out in Morocco and wrote, uh, uh, well, a number of very important studies. I've had a charmed life in some ways. I've been able to do what I wanted and be reasonably well supported while doing it. So I haven't, and certainly overall, I don't feel, feel that I failed or anything, but I've been, you know, some things I wished I had done differently, as always the case, so I can't think of one. And I wouldn't, what that would be, but uh, one of the problems now is again is connected to this thing that emerges the theme here, is that I haven't been back in the field recently, so I don't have recent data to deal with, and I have to figure out how to write about different kinds of essays than I usually write, because uh, you know I just I'm not just back from Morocco or something. I I still keep in contact with that sort of situation, but I'm not doing field work anymore. I'll be, I'll be 80 in a couple of months, so I you know I don't uh, I'm not ready to spend years in the field anymore. So uh, it, you have to constantly shift your persona and your work as it goes on that way. So now I write a lot of reflective work and review work of what's been going on. So, well, my first wife, I did a lot of it because she worked out. My, my second wife was an American Indian scholar. So we, we talk I talk about her work and I talk about mine, but, but it's not the same with Hilly, my first wife, uh, who's still in town and she lives in Hawaii. We're in very good terms, but anyway, um, she and I worked on the same thing. We even wrote a book together. I mean, uh, uh, called Bali's Kinship. It's, uh, Kinship at Bali, it's called. Uh, and we did a lot of and we did a lot of research together. We did field work together, and uh, uh, sometimes we were both interviewed at the same time. Sometimes we did, most time we did separately, but we would do both. And uh, so there, it was very, very uh, intense uh, for the first. And she was with us in Morocco too when I first went to Morocco. And we wrote, uh, then, then there was a book that we co-authored there as well with Larry Rosen, a student of both of us uh, on Morocco, called Meaning and Order in Modern Morocco. Uh, so we was there, it was a very close collaborative relationship as well as with my present wife, as I say, she works on a different field. So we talk about anthropology, but we don't work together because it's not, uh, not the same field. We did, when she was out in the field, we talked about the Zuni and the Navajo as peoples a lot, but we didn't talk too much about education. Of course, the education in, in on the American Indian Reservation is a, can be in some ways of a depressing business because the kids here. Uh, a lot of broken homes and a lot of lost children. Uh, and, and you do there have to understand, if you're teaching Zuni kids or Navajo kids, you have to understand what might be going on with them. Uh, so we talked about a little about that then, but but I've never talked about educational theory or anything like that with it. And my daughter is not of that mind either, I don't think. Well, they, most of them now have, I just went to my granddaughter's eighth grade graduation last night. And there were 
it was a big it's a big school it's out in Montgomery it's the next town over and I mean Chinese Indians I mean it's the whole thing was like the UN I mean it's just tremendous variegation some of our friends are, are, are Indian and, and Chinese and so on and all kinds of uh, Hispanics Italians all kinds of uh, really a mixed group so you're no longer teaching uh, uh, Homeodius is not a question of whether multiculturalism is, is a good idea. It's there. It's uh, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, so you no longer have this homogeneous mass issue, and there's no you, you can't just teach everybody the same or deal with them all the same because there's all kind of uh, differences that, that that you don't know about. And I think certainly have to be sensitive to that. I'm sure they are sensitive to that. I mean, it, it confronts them almost daily. I mean, there's almost nothing that doesn't, that isn't multilingual, multicultural. It's so to be in almost everything that went on. And as I say here, there were a couple hundred kids graduating or whatever it was, and, and it was just incredible range of cultures just represented there in a suburb in the middle of New Jersey. Um, or New York schools, when of course it gets even more so. But it's uh, so I, you, you can no longer, in the same way that we no longer, as anthropologists, can assume a, a, a homo homogeneous audience we're writing for, because when we write, we didn't ask me this, but this usually gets asked. The people you write about read what you write. No. They didn't used to do that either. I mean, people wrote about the Zunis and didn't read it, or I wrote about the Bunga Bunga, the, the Bunga Bungas didn't read it. But if you Write about Java, all my books have been translated, just literally all of them have been translated into Indonesian. There have been university discussions of them and critiques of them. They like them, they don't like them. When I went back, and I went back, uh, well, I've been back many times, but I went back to my town in 1989, again, with Karen, with my, new, with my wife. And uh, I had published a book called The Socialist History of an Indonesian Town, which was a history of this town that I, that I wrote. And it had been translated into Indonesian when I got there. It had just been translated into Indonesian when I arrived. And uh, one of my old informants and the people who worked with me a lot, an old man, a nationalist politician, he went through and I had changed all the names to hide. And he wrote the real names and Xeroxed them and sent them to the people. So it went around, they all had a Xerox about what I had said about them. So it made it, they weren't bad. They were, it was all, right. luckily I didn't say anything very horrible. But, but the point is that there is that. You don't, you're not just, Again, this divided audience business is complicated because it used to be anthropologists could, they went to Samoa and they wrote back and they wrote about Samoa for New Yorkers. You can't do that anymore. Now the Samoans are going to read it. Then the Samoans have. I mean, in the, in the controversy over means work, the Samoans have been very active. So the savage does talk back. I mean, they're not savages, but that's, that's, that's really, so there is a kind of, um, uh, you live in a different kind of environment because when everything you write is going to be read by the people, at least by the generalized people that you are, and some will be read even by the specific people you write about. And uh, uh, the book that I said I wrote with Hilly and, and, and another and a student of mine on Morocco, uh, uh, the mayor of the town, whom I didn't know then because I had, he, I had gone home and he got elected, wrote to me and said he had seen this, heard about this study, could he see it? And I, of course, said yes. Uh, he couldn't read it because it was in English, but and he only knew Arabic and French, but his wife was an English teacher, so she was French. So she read it too and so on, and it had an influence on, on how he ran the town. I mean, he used it as a kind of, he, and, and I later on knew him very well. He luckily, unluckily was killed in a, in a traffic accident, too. but later on. But he, when he was married, he was a socialist mayor of the town, the first one that had been a socialist. And he tried to use, not only that, but I mean, try to use what I had there in, in trying to figure out what he should be doing as mayor. So you have this back and forthness, which again is quite new in anthropology. That, that's only in the last 20 or 30 years that you begin to have that kind of a dialectic. The people, and of course there now, when I first went to Indonesia, there was one anthropologist that was of any stature at all. Now there are dozens, dozens and dozens. In fact, I went, I've set up a series of field stations uh, for the Ford Foundation in the 70s to train anthropologists to do field work. And they were, they were scattered around the country and they trained quite a few of them. And in Morocco, the same way. Uh, when I first went to Morocco, there were no anthropologists I know of, and a few Frenchmen who worked there, but no uh, Moroccan anthropologists. 
Now there are. There are rocket sociologists, rocket anthropologists who really know what the. So you're you're in an international environment to start with, and you're writing as much for them as for, and they can be quite critical. Obviously, if you don't get it right, they'll th they'll be glad to tell you. <laughs> oh, of course, it's a good thing. Yes, uh, you get a, a dialogue going, and that's what we're trying to do is get some sort of a. It's no longer I tell you what you think. Yes, of course, that's why I do anthropology. Um, I wanted to I wanted to bring Indonesians and Moroccans and Americans into a common community of discourse. Uh, that's why I do anthropology. I mean, it, it's an attempt to try to get, try to make people present to one another in and, and, and that sort of way, and to, and to understand. So that's that's what it's what it's all about. Uh, the practical. I mean, it, you know, the fact. I mean, it's rare that you get a direct. But this work in Indonesia too. I mean, the 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 biggest discussions in Indonesia. Over the last 30 years, one of the biggest ones now of particular acuteness is the role of Islam in society. How Muslim should the society be? And I have contributed a great, uh, somewhat controversial view of that. Uh, controversial to Indonesians, controversial to, and they have had controversy over it. They've discussed it, argued about it. I've talked there, uh, written op-ed pieces and stuff of the sort. So. So it does, there is a circular flow. It isn't just, uh, and the audience for it, as I say, is not simply American. It's not just simply uh, students and so on, but it's also, so it's very reciprocal. And, and, and uh, in my case, it's been quite a bit in both cases. It's uh, rather remarkable. Well, I don't know whether, whether we're postmodern or high modern or what we are, but I don't usually think of myself as being postmodern. But, but uh, of course, I think of the society we live in. I, did try to talk earlier about how things have changed over time, and what, uh, if anything, I think society, our society, was rather more open in the 50s and 60s than it is now. I think I said that before that you know that there, was, right after the war, we were, we were the United States was much more interested in what other people thought, and it was a time of the Third World Revolution, and new countries were coming into being, and the United States was much interested in fighting, and that sort of waned a bit. Now we're sort of very self-consciously about to change the world in our own image and so on. I uh, don't want to get into contemporary politics, but I obviously am not at all happy with the direct, main direction of contemporary politics in the United States. Uh, and it ha isn't toward understanding people, it's sort of trying to make them into our own image so we can understand them as us. <laughs> and it's, uh, I mean, I can't imagine people going into a society like the Iraqi one with less knowledge about what it's all about than we have had. Now that doesn't mean that anthropologists can solve all the problems or anything of the sort, but without some sort of deeper, I mean, it took them a long time to discover the difference between Shi'is and Sunnis. You know, they could have thought about that before because there's a lot been written on Shi'is and Sunnis. Um, I did a book not on that, but on comparing Islam in Indonesia and Morocco, uh, called Islam Observed, which was a contrasting dialectic move back and forth between. Indonesia and Morocco, and, and, and the main argument was sort of as, as you know, Italian Catholicism is Catholicism, but Italian Catholicism and and Greek Catholicism and Portuguese Catholicism and Brazilian Portuguese are not exactly the same, or in America are not exactly the same thing, and the same is true of Islam. Islam is Islam, and it's uh, but Islam in Morocco and Islam in Indonesia, well, they've both been there for some several hundred years, uh, work out quite differently, uh, and have a different kind of color to them. Uh, so that's the sort of thing that, that I think is practical knowledge and has some sort of sense that people don't have a simple notion that Islam is the same everywhere. And, uh, and uh, right now, that's that particular view, not that particular book, but the particular view, is, seems to me of some great importance. Uh, and a number of the things, there was a time when I think we were more sophisticated about these things than we are now, but maybe that's just nostalgia or something. No, uh, my good granddaughter, thick description with me, I ascribed to it appeared in one of her textbooks, and she was very thrilled by that. <laughs> but uh, no, I don't think so. They, they're learning, studying Spanish, which is good. Well, I, yeah, we lived on on what my father sent, which wasn't very much, in on in debt. But but it was uh, I, actually I was in the, lucky to be in the countryside because it you could sort of. We were poor, but it didn't, it wasn't, I don't, I can't really claim poverty. We, I always had enough to eat and always had clothes. 
but you didn't have to have fancy clothes and you didn't have to have very complicated things to eat. Um, so I lived in this place uh, uh, in the school, and it was all spread out. So I had a the bus in one direction. The grammar, elementary school was was four or five miles by bus, and in the other one it was eight and a half or ten miles to high school. So we spent a lot of time riding back and forth. But uh, the depression, you know, everybody was hurting, and and people were much were recognizing that, and. Uh, and uh, helped each other out a great deal. And you, uh, everybody had a sort of, we had a, a big debt to the local store and it was all very, but it was, you know, it was also pre-war and so things were beginning to heat up that way. And of course Roosevelt was a national hero there. I mean, he was, this was very Roosevelt country. I first memory I can have, remember in high school, was, I mean, in grammar school, in the first grade going around and being on it, this is 32, which I went to school in grade two, being on a top of a gag, of a garbage can saying, Hoover, Hoover, put him in the gas. Franklin Roosevelt, Roosevelt, rah, 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 Hoover, Hoover, put him in a gas can, blah, blah, blah. I mean, so it's the earliest, earliest political, it was a very political place. Everybody was, was uh, Roosevelt was the voice of hope, not fear, fear itself. And we used to listen to all the, uh, over the radio, which is the only thing we had then, but we did have a radio. Uh, listen to him talk, and he was the beacon of hope for all of us. Uh, but it was a very simple life. Uh, we all got by. I mean, I, I, no one was starving that I could see. Uh, but nobody was doing very well. Some people, some people were doing reasonably well, but not very many. And, and in this village I grew up in, nobody was. I mean, there was one or two people who owned some land, and they were better off. But nobody was really wealthy. Well, it was a little like that, yeah. <laughs> well, and also your parent and my the woman who took care of me protected me against it. She was, I think, quite worried because of this, this big balance that she had with the grocery store, which I found out about later. Um, but she didn't tell me that. I mean, I didn't realize that we were, we were really on the knife's edge. She was very worried, and she kept trying to get a little bit more money from my father, who was reluctant to do anything. But uh, so we were, our position was much more perilous than I realized. Now, it wasn't so perilous because we did survive, and she eventually got to pay it off and so on. But, I think she worried a lot at that time about how we were going to make it, but she didn't tell me that. I didn't, and I think I was true of the other kids. There were some. There was a group of kids, ten or so, in the village, and there. From I can remember now. If I look back on it now, I can see that their fathers were having a hell of a time. I mean, working in the middle of the night and doing. I mean, go do all kinds of odd jobs of one sort or another. But they protected the kids against this. They didn't didn't tell them how. So it wasn't so we were so poor we didn't notice it was that the people who were taking care of us or in most cases their families protected us and said, you know, and, you, you know, and, and it wasn't, is also the other reason, it, it sort of goes along with what you said about being so poor. Nobody had fancy things that we didn't have. I mean, we didn't, you know, we didn't want automobiles. Nobody had automobiles. I mean, one or two people in town had automobiles. So we didn't, we didn't, you know, so it wasn't a matter of like kids now, they don't have Nike shoes or Nike shoes or something, they, they feel that they're under, underprivileged. But we didn't, we didn't, there wasn't that consumer economy, so it was a little easier to be poor. It wasn't quite so devastating. Well, it's true. Uh, one of the big shifts in anthropology, as I said, came after the war when anthropologists who had been working with tribal peoples, very simple people, suddenly were confronted with large civilizations and, and countries which were becoming independent. Actually, next year at the Institute here, we're going to have a year, a thematic year, of people coming who are working on, the th on what happened to the wor Third World 50 years after. And uh, so it's going to look at, it's been about 50 years since the Bandung Conference and when, when the Third World sort of formed, the non-aligned movement came into being. So yes, when I first started out, it didn't exist. It formed while I was there and in the middle of it. And it's now more or less passed in that form. It's just beginning to become and uh, something else. So it's a, it's a sort of completed historical chapter we would like to look at and see what, and I, I've been fortunate because I got in just as it started to become a third world, and I'm still here when it's now becoming something else, and so I hope to do something on that kind of thing. But, but no, it was, it was, as I said, there was this, all these area studies, this concern with, with, with Asia and Africa and Latin America, it was very strong in the beginning and has slowly become more routinized and more you know, part of us.
<laughs> no, I don't think there will be in those terms. I think already uh, it's much more differentiated than it once was. Some countries, India, China, Taiwan, are developing very well. Others are getting along sort of OK, India, Indonesia, and Morocco, but not really splitting ahead. And others, much of black Africa, other parts of Asia, are so it's much more different. People even talk about the fourth world now in, in Africa where, where things are really very bad. So it's a much more differentiated picture. I suppose it was differentiated to some degree in the beginning, but it, it's much more so now. So, And the, and the third world movement in alignment is sort of... I, I gave a talk, uh, I had to give the Irving Howe Memorial Lecture a couple of years ago in New York, and I gave a talk on, on what was the third world revolution, trying to say... And so it was now almost more or less... Uh, an historical chapter. Well, I, one of the core beliefs is that people can be understood. Uh, that it is the difference is real, but it's not a it's not a block to understanding and to and to and to comprehension. It, it's hard. You have to learn languages. You have to stay with live with the people. You have to work hard at doing it. But it's a possible thing. Anthropology, therefore, is a possible discipline. You can actually. Then there's some you know the, nowadays, especially in extreme some of the postmodernist movements. People who would deny that and say you can't understand anybody outside your own tradition, and I, of course, don't believe that. Uh, if I did, I wouldn't do what I was doing. Uh, it is difficult. It is hard, and their differences are real and not to be papered over by some sort of hyper-generalized description of things that, that buries all the differences. But it is possible to understand people across very large gulfs of difference and differences in meaning. So that's why I do it, and it's what it is. So I. I don't know what else to say. Some, a lot of the critics are challenged from from what you call a scientific point of view. That is, they seem to think that uh, the attacks are it's what I do is too subjective, is too personal, uh, and how do you know it's true? How do you test it? And all that sort of thing. Uh, as I think I've made clear, I, I don't. I don't respond to that critic by trying to do what they want me to do, but I try to understand and try to figure out ways to make my work more uh, more intersubjectively validated. Uh, there's also, of course, critics within the same tradition. I, I, I said once that you know I, I get criticized for not going far enough and going too far at the same time. Depends on which side you're looking at. Uh, some of the postmodern stuff seems to me to be a little uh, self-indulgent and, and solipsistic, and so I try to... Now, but all this plays on you in very important ways. I almost never answer critics directly. Once or twice I have, but by and large I don't. I just try to keep in mind what they've said while I'm writing the next thing and incorporate it into that. But I don't I don't like polemic very much. Uh, uh, as Namir said, you know, People who always said polemics are more interested in themselves and their work. But I, so I don't, I haven't been involved in many polemics. I don't like them and I don't find it useful. And so I have been criticized. That means a lot of critique. Uh, and, so, and some of it cogent. But uh, I don't engage in, in too much simple debate on methodological things. I have to just go forward with my work and take, try to take into, into and keep it in the back of my mind or even in the front of it these kinds of critiques of, you know, how, is, how do you know you're not being just, you know, you're not just talking to yourself and so on. These are really important issues on the one side. On the other side, uh, am I being too still objectivized? Uh, you know, many people as objects and deal with them. So you just keep going between this and Charybdis all the time, trying to navigate as you go. And as you go, people criticize your work and you try to take it into account. As I say, I don't usually respond to the critics in direct and explicit terms, but I certainly do respond to it in terms of how I shape my work. Well, I just said exactly what I was going, what I'm working on now, what I hope to do. The future, I'm 80 years old, so the future has got a limit to it. But um, I'm really concerned now, having thinking back, to try to think back systematically and constructively on the whole third world period from 1950 to, to the present just before the present. And I hope to be able to write something about that, about what what characterized 
characterize it more generally. As I say, I'm not doing field work anymore, so it won't be field work based. It'll be based on other people's field work and on other kind of work. But that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to start that. That's why we're going to have a session here next year with people working on Africa, people working on Asia, and so on, all of whom are concerned with similar problems. And I will try to at least uh, produce some sort of uh, an accounting of of those, well, essentially 50 years or so of uh, of work of my own and of other people's work as well. Now, it's a big task, and, it me, and it's much more of a library task, is perhaps, than, than the fieldwork task this time. But that's what I hope to be doing, is what I am doing, trying to work on it, and see if it gets anywhere. I say I've already started with a couple of essays, one on what was the Third World Revolution, some other essays that I've been writing recently on Islam. So. Well, as I say, it was an after-the-fact sort of thing. I was trying to say what I've been doing. Uh, I had a pause, and I had for before I wrote it, I had been spending a great deal of time doing field work and writing about field work in a very empirical way. And all of a sudden, I was asked to stop and reflect on what it was I had been doing. And so it was, a, as I say, a, re, a, a attempt to look back on, on about a decade or t 15 years or worth of work and try to say what holds us together, what makes sense of us, what is it, what is it that you could see as thematic in these variously different kind of essays that were involved. So that was the well, the main attempt was to do that was to try to say uh, what it was I had been doing. Try to say to myself when you say it sort of brings the reflections of. It's true, you try to figure, you do it sort of unconsciously and intuitively, and then you have to step back and reflectively think on what it is you were doing. And that's what it was all about. I, uh, I, I'm pleased that you liked it, and I just, it was an attempt to get people into the book, and that was the main, it was unlike all the other essays and so on. It wasn't based on, particularly, there was some ethnographic material in it, but it wasn't particularly based on ethnography. And it was a it was a kind of meta level sort of thing an attempt to say what I was going, and uh, and it did have it did strike a chord. People have used it a lot, and I'm pleased that they did. At the time, that wasn't the point. The point was just to s to make an introduction to the book that would make the rest of the book seem coherent and make sense, and and that the the various subjects and differences that were dealt with there would seem to make more sense of it, what to be collected between this between covers of one book. So I keep going back. I've been in both right. places. Right. Yeah. Now. Yeah. But okay. you do feel after a while. That's all for now. Uh, uh, not so much that the culture is exhausted, but you are. Uh, that this is you no. Know, you're not seeing things fresh anymore, and and you and you and you really need to get home and, and yeah. get out of it and, and sort of get away from it. Uh, so after two and a half years, I was ready to come back. And then in Morocco, I was went back four or five times for a year. Yeah. Uh, a little after a year or so, or even two years. Do you feel it's about time it's something else? Because it's, uh, it's exhausting, too. That's a 24-hour job. Right? Yeah. And uh, so you just, but you never have enough. I mean, you, uh, after I went home,